Well, the year was 48 A.D. 48 A.D., and the Apostle Paul had just returned from his first missionary journey. His very first missionary journey, uh, he and Barnabas have come back. Uh, Brother Nathan's going to put a map up on the screen, and you're going to see they're going to come back uh, there on your, let's see, it would be your right side, uh, on Antioch in Syria. They've come back. It's been a little over two years, and they have been out on that missionary journey. Now, as you can see, when you look up to the top part of the screen, you'll see the word Galatia there. You'll see several cities listed, lots of arrows. Uh, they, they spent some time elsewhere, but the majority of their time on that first mission trip was spent in Galatia. And they visited such towns as Iconium and Lystra and Pisidia and Laconia and Derby. And at each of these places, they had the chance to minister for the Lord. And uh, Acts 13 and 14, which is where you can go on your own time, check out Acts 13 and 14. It gives you kind of a narrative of this first journey and how it went. And if you read it, you will see that Paul and Barnabas were absolutely thrilled because the mission journey that they went on was very, very successful. Uh, they, they were used by God. Uh, they were able to see people come to know and, and experience uh, becoming a part of Christ, the relationship that he had with Christ. No doubt Paul reflected back to his day on the road to Damascus some 15 years earlier where he experienced Jesus. He encountered Jesus and his life was changed. So no doubt, as Paul and Barnabas are making their way back to Antioch in Syria, no doubt they're absolutely excited, absolutely elated about what God had done. However, they had not been back in Antioch long before they realized that they weren't going to have much time to reflect, or Paul wasn't going to have much time to reflect on what God had done or to continue celebrating what God had done in the not only the individual lives there that they had seen come to know Christ, but also in the local body of believers that they had started. Now, can I ask you a question? Like I asked the first service, what's another name for local body of believers? Very good. It's church. Church is who we are. Church is not where we are. Church is not this building. We are a local body of believers. Many members, one body. Yes, this local body of believers represents the universal body of Christ that is all throughout the world, made up of everyone who has said yes to him. But we are those local body of believers. And Paul and Barnabas had not only had the joy of seeing people get saved, but in the two years that they were gone in each one of these locations, they were able to found and start a local body of believers, a church, and begin to watch them grow. Something else that they were celebrating. But again, the celebration couldn't last long. The reflection on what God had done could not last long because Paul, not long after getting back to Antioch, Paul got some really disturbing news. He got some real negative news from the churches in that area of Galatia. Now, what was the news? Well, one commentary describes it like this. Judaizers, false teachers, had infiltrated the infant churches in Galatia, and they were denying the Apostle Paul's authority as an apostle. Now, not only were they denying, not only were they coming into these uh, new baby Christians in these new uh, growing churches and telling them that Paul was not an ap apostle, telling them that Paul did not have an authority, but they were even teaching to these new Gentiles specifically. Paul had gotten to see Jews and Gentiles alike come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but they were specifically talking uh, to these Gentiles. Right, who God called Paul to go after for his glory. And they were telling these Gentiles, look, what Paul told you is not true. He doesn't have any authority. And what he told you is not true. You're not really saved. And the only way you can be really saved is, yeah, this Jesus thing might be part of it. But you're not really saved unless you religiously follow all of the rules and regulations and customs and traditions. You're not really saved unless you get circumcised. And they were telling this to all of these new believers. Well, as Paul gets this word, he immediately recognizes what's going on as a serious threat. These are brand new believers and brand new churches that are on the verge of falling prey to the very false theology that Paul himself had been enslaved to many years ago. 
And what he saw was the fact that these baby Christians in these baby churches were about to willingly sacrifice their newfound freedom in Christ in exchange for the bondage of legalism. He realizes that these new Christians are allowing themselves to be reshackled by the sin-filled, self-centered, false teachings of grace plus good works. Legalism. He realized that they have been freed by faith in God's gift of grace alone through Christ alone. But they were on the verge of abandoning that. Solo gratia, solo fide, solos Christus. Solo gratia, solo fide, solos Christus. This is the Latin expression for by grace alone through faith alone, in Christ alone. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Hear me, church. This is the Magna Carta of Christian liberty. This is the only true and legitimate gospel. It is the only true and legitimate good news of Jesus Christ. And it is for this reason that Paul wrote this letter to these churches who were being bombarded with false theology in Galatia. There was, a very, there was very much a question of desperation in the first century, and it follows all the way up to the 21st century, and what Paul is writing about, right? Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, it is the answer to this desperate question. And what is the question? Is the cross enough? Is what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary enough? Was Jesus' shed blood enough? Was Jesus enough? Now let me give you a summary of the book of Galatians. Yes, it is. Amen. We should all be rejoicing over the fact that His grace is enough. We just sang about it. We should be rejoicing over it because Jesus is enough. As one author put it, Galatians is an emphatic statement of salvation by faith apart from works. It is as relevant today as it was when it was originally penned. This morning, we're beginning a new series through the book of Galatians. It has a real simple title. Free. Free. And however long it is that the Lord gives us to stay in this book, I have no idea how that is, we're going to be focused on that. Focused on the freedom that we have in Christ. And as we do this, we're going to be taking a look at what it could what a Christian's life could and should look like if we really grab, if we really understand the life-altering message of grace. Free. Now, why is this crucial? Why is it crucial? Well, as one pastor put it, he said, I truly believe we as evangelical Christians totally understand the concept of being saved by grace. But I'm afraid, he goes on, that's where we leave it. He says, we at times show that we have no clue as to what it means to live by grace. We know to be saved by grace, but do we know how to live by grace? With that in mind, if you haven't already, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Galatians. The first chapter in Galatians, and this morning we're actually going to be focused on, based out of, the first ten verses. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Follow along with me as we see how Paul begins this letter. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, Grace to you and peace from God, Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil age, 
according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, and Paul there is including himself, even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant to Christ. Now, as we begin reading this opening or this introduction to the letter of Galatians, we see real quickly that something is wrong. Something is radically wrong. And we see this because the introduction to this letter is not Paul's normal introduction. Normally it gives a kind of a lengthy praise to God and a prayer for the saints. So the question is why? Why is there no, why is it it's almost like he has to get right to business? Well, it's because Paul realizes there's a serious problem. Paul realizes that he has no time uh, to mamby-pamby around. Paul's got to get down to business because he knows that he's about to engage in a battle of truth for the gospel. He knows he's getting ready to engage in battle for the truth of liberty in the Christian life. Why? Because false teachers were doing what false teachers do. Doing what false teachers did then and doing what false teachers do now. They were assaulting the gospel. And what they were doing in their false teachers' teaching with the gospel is they were having a mixture of law and grace. They were preaching a mixture of work and grace. And Paul knew he had to address this immediately. And Paul knew that he had to address this with extreme fervor. And so what does Paul say first? Well, Paul lays out his credentials. Now, Paul doesn't do this out of arrogance. Paul is trying to make a point. Paul is saying, listen to me, I'm an apostle. And I didn't get this message, this gospel message from a man. I experienced Christ Jesus. I saw Christ Jesus visibly after the resurrection and I received this word from him so listen to me Paul saying I'm not playing around here what I'm about to tell you is serious he says and I'm serious not because I say it's serious not because I'm taking this out of the first book of Paul but Paul says no I come to you on the authority of the word of Jesus Christ that is why Paul emphasizes to them who he is Paul recognizes just like I recognize that the only authority I have when I get up to speak to you is the authority of the Word of God. If I get up here every week and I give you some encouraging message, some ear-tickling stuff from the first book of Rob, get out. It will do you no good. You may feel a little tingly and good before you walk out of here, but it ain't going to last because it's not the Word of God. And it's the only authority I have, the only authority Paul had. And he made that known. He wanted these people to know this message comes from God. This letter is God's Word. This message of Christ comes from Him. Well, then Paul begins a bit of a theological discourse regarding true grace. And the first issue he deals with is this. Number one, when you add anything to grace, it ain't grace. When you add anything to grace, it ain't grace. Now let me illustrate this for you quickly. The majority of you that know me know that your pastor loves coffee. Pure coffee. All right? There are two aspects to pure coffee. Pure water and pure coffee. Let me repeat that. There are two and two only aspects to pure coffee. Pure water and pure coffee. 
If you add anything else to the pure water and the pure coffee, it is no longer pure coffee. It is distorted. Now, my wife is sitting right here. I preached this really boldly in the first service, and I tried to have that boldness here, but I know I'm being stared at by the, by the pharisaical look of this distorted coffee drinker. Because I don't care if it's the greatest pumpkin spice cream known to man. I don't care if it's proudly served by Starbucks. It ain't proudly pure coffee because you have added something to it. And that is exactly what Paul is trying to say here. If you add anything to grace, it is not grace anymore. Now here's the thing. As a pastor, I can only imagine the sorrow that was bombarding Paul. As he writes this letter, verse 6, he says, and again, he's speaking to these people whom he loves. He traveled thousands of miles, two years, used by God to see them saved and starting churches and saying yes to Christ and being freed from the false theology that even Paul was bound by for a time. And he says to them, I marvel, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him. Now the word him there is very important and in most translations if you look it's going to be capitalized. You want to know why? Because Paul's not talking about himself. Paul's talking about God. He's saying I marvel that you are turning away so soon from God who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Paul had to be heartbroken. And he wasn't worried about these people abandoning him. Again, it wasn't from the first book of Paul. Paul wasn't saving them. Paul wasn't offering them this grace. He wasn't the source of it. No, Paul was brokenhearted and talking to them because they were considering abandoning Christ, abandoning the good news of pure grace. They were being told, He, that is Jesus, is not enough. And they were listening. Now, the good news here, if you examine the words that they're used here, most translations, the English word is deserting or turning away. If you actually look at the original language and the type of verb that they use there, you can see that they hadn't done it yet. They hadn't abandoned, right? They, they were considering, they were on the edge, and they were being swayed by these false teachers, by these Judaizers. But Paul recognizes why he had to get in and speak with them so soon because they were on the verge. They were on the ledge of, of abandoning. And Paul was saying, please come down. Now listen, I have no doubt that the young Christians in the Galatians, in the Galatian area, were probably wondering, what's the big deal, Paul? And they're not taking Jesus away. They're saying Jesus plus something. I mean, what's a few religious rituals and traditions? Uh, what's a few sacraments? What's the big deal? Won't this actually make it more pronounced? Won't this actually make the gospel uh, better? And Paul says, no, no. Paul looks and says, no, it's not possible. You can't make it stronger. It's wrong. Now notice what Paul says about their teaching. He says, a different gospel, which is not another. Really what Paul's saying is here is, listen, there's not another gospel. There's not another option. I hate to even say it like that, right? He says it's wrong. He goes on in a few minutes to use the word perversion. Let's not even call this good news because it's not. He is slamming on the message that these false theologians, these uh, Judaizers have brought. He calls them perverters of grace. Paul's saying, listen, this is not an alternative interpretation. When it comes to the gospel, when it comes to grace, you don't have two choices. There's only one. He's saying you're falling prey to something that is totally different. And when you have something that's different than the true gospel, it is no longer the true gospel, the true good news. And so therefore it's not good news at all because it doesn't have the ability to do anything in anyone's life. It doesn't have the power to, to save anyone. As one pastor put it, we must never forget that the Christian life is in a living relationship with God through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. A man does not become a Christian merely by agreeing to a set of doctrines or practices or traditions or rituals. 
but by submitting to Christ and trusting in Christ and Christ alone. Hear me. You cannot mix grace and works. You cannot mix grace and works because they are exclusive to each other. You cannot. But don't take my word for it. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should brag. Church, salvation is the gift of God's grace purchased by Jesus Christ on the cross. The cost, his blood, the cost, his life, the cost, God forsaking him. And so therefore, if you add anything to grace, the law, the works, you are actually deserting the very God who saved you by his grace. Galatians speaks of it. Ephesians speaks of it. Listen to how Romans backs it up in Romans 11, verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would be grace no longer. When you add works, grace is no longer grace. And that's what Paul is saying in plain English. He's saying, listen to me, church. Listen to me, Christians. If you add anything to grace, it's not grace. If it's grace plus anything, he says, listen, if Jesus plus nothing doesn't equal salvation, it's Jesus plus nothing. It can't be Jesus plus anything. It can't be grace plus anything. It can't be grace plus church membership. It can't be grace plus baptism. It can't be grace plus communion. It can't be grace plus speaking in tongues or any other gifts. It can't be grace plus good works, plus scripture, plus memory, plus plus scripture memory, not memory, plus script, sacraments, plus service, plus uh, revival, plus traditions, plus rituals, plus anything. It ain't grace plus performance. It's just grace. And as we sang about this morning, His grace is enough. Anything else destroys the, the actual concept of grace itself. Because true saving grace is the unmerited. You know what unmerited means? Unearned. You can't earn it. It is the unmerited favor of God. It requires no works. Now hear me. And if anyone tells you differently, then they are not speaking of saving grace. They are speaking of a distortion of grace. And I'm going to use another biblical phrase for anyone that teaches a distorted grace. Hear me. Woe unto you because Paul has made it clear when you add anything to grace it ain't grace but now number two Paul's going to add this judgment awaits anyone who distorts grace judgment awaits anyone who distorts grace please look back with me at verses 8 and 9 Paul says but even we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than we have preached to you let him be accursed as we have said before so now I say again if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received let him be accursed the commentator Timothy George said this in his writings that just could not be said any better he says the fact that Paul issued this condemnation in the strongest words possible and then repeated it for emphasis makes this one of the harshest statements in the entire New Testament. For you see, it does not set well on modern ears that are accustomed to tolerance at any price and a doctrine of God devoid of the notions of judgment and wrath. Yet... Here it stands. Yet, here it stands stubbornly and ominously at the forefront of Paul's concern. He goes on, all throughout history of the church, there have been those who have attempted to distort grace, and it will continue until the return 
of Jesus Christ. To emphasize the fact that the true gospel of the grace of God cannot be changed, Paul first stated a hypothetical case. He said, if he, and he was a divinely called apostle, if he or an angel, a heavenly messenger, he says, were to alter the gospel message, let him be accursed. And Timothy George finishes this section by quoting Martin Luther. He says in his commentary, Martin Luther said, Here, Paul is breathing fire. His zeal is so fervent that he almost begins to curse the angels themselves. Paul says, If you distort the message of grace, you will be accursed. Now, I think it's important that we take a look at that word to make sure we understand what it means. You see, the Greek word that is translated into the English word accursed is actually the word anathema. Anathema. And here in this passage, though at times anathema can be translated as excommunicated, here in this passage it is clearly not that. Here in this passage, when you translate the word that became accursed, it has to do with eternal condemnation. That is the translation. It means when you distort the message of grace, if you do not feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and repent from that, one day you are going to do nothing less than to suffer the eternal retribution and judgment of God. There's a translation of the Bible out there called the Good News Bible. I'm simply going to quote how it quotes this verse simply because I believe it captures the essence of Paul's tone as he is issuing this warning. Here's what the Good News of the Good News Bible says, For him who distorts the grace of God, let him be condemned to hell. Now listen, Paul is making it very clear that not only is messing with grace serious business with serious consequences, but he also reminds those of us who might be listening to these messages that the status of the messenger, you know, because Paul's referring to himself, even if I, he says, an apostle of Jesus Christ, even if I, or an angel. And so what Paul is also trying to say here is, look, the status of the messenger doesn't change the, dis the distortion of the message. So what are you trying to say, Rob? I don't care who you're hearing it from. I don't care if it's from the pulpit or a television evangelist or a revivalist. I don't care. If they are preaching something that is a distortion of the grace of God given in God's word as faith in Christ and Christ alone, then disregard the teaching, for it is not true. Now listen, Paul wasn't asking them to be loyal to him. And I'm not asking you to be loyal to me. I'm asking you to be loyal to the Word of God and the God who wrote it, His message, and His message alone. We have to learn that we are living in a world where there's going to come a time when we're going to have to take a stand against false theology. We're going to have to take a stand against the assault that is coming on the Word of God. And we've got to do it because grace is at stake. The message of God is at stake. The souls of men and women are at stake. I want to quote one more theologian. For he says it so well. John Phillips said this, Throughout scripture the strongest language is reserved not for the murderer or the extortioner, but for those who teach religious error. John the Baptist called Pharisees and Sadducees a, a generation of vipers, Matthew 3, 7. Jesus Christ himself called the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites, whitewashed tombs, serpents, and generation of vipers, Matthew 23. Now, Phillips concludes, Paul pours out his own divinely inspired barrage of condemnation against the Judaizers or anyone else at any other time in history, for that matter, who promotes any type of false doctrine, particularly a religion that denies the true doctrine and definition of grace, grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone, period. I'm not sure if it's gotten across to you, but I'm serious about this because Paul was serious about this because God was serious about this. But Paul 
makes it clear that there's one more thing, one more jewel, one more principle we need to grab from this opening. It comes in verse 10, then we're going to read it in just a second. We've learned that anything added to grace, it ain't grace, right? We've learned that if you distort the message of grace, you're going to face severe judgment. But number three, this is very important. Spiritual insecurity is a constant enemy of living grace. Spiritual insecurity is a constant enemy of living grace. And before I go into this point, I want to take a little sidestep on this. Can I tell you that many, many times in the lives of Christians, why you are spiritually insecure? As your pastor, I love you. But as your pastor, it is my job to equip you. It is my job to tell you what the Word of God says. And this morning, I need to tell you something. Many times in the lives of so many Christians, you suffer from spiritual insecurity because you are dealing with spiritual immaturity. Or I should say, you refuse to deal with spiritual immaturity. You have no clue what the Bible says, and so therefore you can't defend what the Bible says. And I hate to tell you this, but the blame for that lays on nobody but yourself. I need to make something clear to you. If you were relying on one sermon from me a week and maybe some Bible study lessons to give you the spiritual maturity that you need, you're never going to get there. Spiritual maturity comes from you getting into God's Word, learning God's Word, reading God's Word, getting God's Word in context, learning how to apply God's Word in your life. Yeah, coming to church. Yeah, coming to Bible study, taking advantage of that stuff. But can I tell you why it is that we as Christians lose so many battles when it comes to defending the Word of God? Because we don't know the Word of God. I'm going to be real with you, real, real with you. If a few minutes ago, when I started to reference Ephesians 2, 8, 9, if you couldn't say that verse with me, because that's a foundational scripture, you may need to check yourself and say, do I know the Word of God like I'm supposed to know it? Am I growing in it? Am I living by it? Is it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? Am I hiding God's word in my heart? Am I meditating on it day and night? Am I living it? We want to be victorious over the spiritual insecurity. Let us be victorious over the spiritual immaturity. Know God's word. So you can share God's word. Defend God's word. Share God's word. Because you know we are all commissioned disciples, making disciples who make disciples. Because i got to tell you something. Satan and his forces, which includes false theology, they're out there doing their job. They're out there doing their job. And though they are preaching a false doctrine, they are preaching it. And they are telling people about it. Do you understand how powerful the Mormon church is and how quickly they're growing? You want to know the main reason why? They've got people out there every day of the week telling people about why they should believe in the Mormon religion. We were at the gospel mission just a couple of weeks ago, and as we were coming out of the gospel mission, my girls were asking me about these men that were standing there helping people, talking to people, and and why they were doing that. And according to the way they were dressed, I knew why they were doing it, because they were on their mission trip as part of the Church of Latter-day Saints. They're out there doing it, and they know their stuff, and they know how to share their stuff. Do we? Do we know our stuff? Do we know how to share our stuff? Do we know where to find answers? And when we don't have the answers, do we go looking for them? Or do we make something up? Or not answer at all? May we be a church that is dedicated to not being spiritually immature, so therefore we're not spiritually insecure. All of God's people said, I love you. And all of that was for free. Spiritual insecurity is a constant enemy of living grace. I read somewhere, and I couldn't have said it any better. It says, when you really get a hold of grace, when you really get a hold of grace, true grace, and try to teach it, try to live it, try to model it, listen, you better decide on the front end to accept the fact 
that there will always be a constant battle between you being content to please God as you live out grace or gaining the approval of the legalistic crowd that's always going to be around you. Let me say that again. When you really get a hold of grace and try to teach it, model it, live it, you're going to have to decide on the front end to accept the fact that there will always be a constant battle between being content with pleasing God and gaining the approval of the legalistic crowd that will always be around us in some form. Because just about the time you think you've checked all the boxes to make all those people happy, there's going to be one more box that's going to be added. There's going to be one more thing that has to be done. Paul lets us know that he's dealt with this. Look at verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still... Pay attention to the word. For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Let me ask you something. By Paul saying, if I still please men, what does that tell us he used to do? Ah, Paul, when he was wrapped up, right, as the Jew of all Jews, right, on that quick trip to the top. He knew so much about custom and Jewish tradition and religion and the Torah. And it was all about pleasing men. Until what happened on the road to Damascus? I'll tell you what happened. He experienced true grace and true love when he experienced Jesus Christ. And when he experienced Jesus Christ, he understood what grace really, really His life was radically transformed and there was no turning back. But though there was no turning back, let me stop making Paul some kind of superhero because he's not. He's just a guy that was available. And God took an ordinary dude and did extraordinary things with him. And so because Paul was just an ordinary dude, just like you and me, and because Paul had fell prey to uh, false theology and legalistic teaching and grace plus works And all of that stuff, man-pleasing, I guarantee you that Paul struggled at times. Even as Paul was doing what he was called to do, he probably still wondered at times, can grace really be this amazing? You know, we have. I've thought that. Can grace really be this amazing? Can all of that other stuff really be that bad? Now, if you've not ever been exposed to legalism, then praise God for you. But I have. I have, not just as a pastor, but I'm talking about even as a kid and a young person growing up. I experienced legalism, and because of that, I share some of these same struggles. At times, I sit back and I think, man, maybe I'm just not living right. I'm not doing it that well. Maybe there there are Christians that are out there that are better than me. Am I even saved? (laughs) And here's what you have to make the choice on the front end. Ain't nothing but the grace. The grace. Let me tell you why I'm saved. Because I said yes to the grace of God. Let me tell you why Jesus loves me. Because he loves me. And Jesus loves me as much today as he did back when, before I got saved. The day that I was born. There's nothing that I can do that makes Christ love me more or appreciate me more. Nothing. His grace is enough. Let me share a statement with you that freed me, and it'll free you. You'll never know the true joy of following Christ until His approval is the only thing you need. You will never know, you will never experience the true joy of following Christ until His approval is the only thing you need. Rick Corum, Rick Corum quoted Adrian Rogers from this very pulpit. doesn't matter who said it because they both said it and they both agreed on it. If you please God, it doesn't matter who you displease. But if you displease God, it doesn't matter who you please. I'm going to close with this question. Is there any danger in me teaching about true grace. Please, if you weren't watching, please watch me. Is there any 
danger. I'm quoting danger on purpose. In me teaching you and God teaching me about true grace. Yes, there's danger. Are there Christians, Christians that call themselves Christians that abuse true grace? Are there Christians that live the life that says, you know what? It's all about grace, so it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how I live. I'm saved by grace and grace alone, and so how I live in my life really doesn't matter. Yes, there are people that take advantage of that. Are there people that are going to misunderstand my message this morning, and they're going to think that that's exactly what I was teaching, that they're going to think that because I believe that it's grace and grace alone, nothing else, you're going to believe that I don't believe in and I'm not going to teach living according to Christ, living according to God, that I don't believe in sanctification, that I don't believe in becoming more like Christ, that I don't believe that God has things that He wants me to obey and a track that He wants me to stay on. You're misunderstanding me. And so let me make sure I clear this up. It's all about grace. Because grace comes from God. Just like salvation comes from God and sanctification comes from God. And the ability for me to do anything for God comes from Him. You understand that, right? We are all sinners. And we all deserve hell. And we all deserve judgment. And none of us were going to turn to God on our own. We only turned to God because He graciously came to us and made us aware of the need. And so we turned to Him. I'm only becoming more like Him on a daily basis because of His grace. The same grace that saved me is the same grace that sustains me. It's the same grace that will empower me. It's the same grace that, praise God, one day will transport me from here on this earthly place that is truly not my home to the kingdom of God that I am there because of the blood and grace of Jesus Christ. Grace is the foundation for everything. We have no ability. We have no hope. We have no future outside of the grace of God. Now, because we know that. Now, because we know what we've been given, we serve Him with a heart that says, I can never thank you enough. I'm not serving you to earn your grace. I'm serving you because of your grace. I'm not living like you to earn your love. I'm serving and living and becoming like you because of your love. There's the difference. I know that it's grace and nothing else. I know that Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. But because of that, we ought to desire to spend the rest of our lives writing a thank you note to Him by living for Him and doing exactly what He wants us to do. That is why Paul fought for grace. That is why we should be willing to fight for grace. What can wash away my sins? What can make me whole again? Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Say it, church. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you had any doubt this morning, His grace is.